Um, it's been such a delight to be here um, because I think in the, in the church, we, we underestimate sometimes how much we need one another and that we need to be refueled and encouraged by one another. So apart from whether anything I've said has been remotely helpful or interesting to you, one of the things for me is coming and hearing what you're doing and that that is an encouragement for me to take back to the Diocese of Edmonton and that it's going to be just great news for people there to hear about what you're doing. So thank you very much. So the kinds of things I've been hearing from you, which I think is what I'm supposed to do now to reflect, right? So let's see if I can reflect and stay on track. I think I've been hearing about God's new thing here in the Diocese of Toronto. So many conversations, so many wonderful ideas and, and images of what God is doing, and it's been great. I think I'm seeing a diocese that is not in survival anxiety, and if you read many of the papers and, and blog sites, um, um, you would find, I think, that we're supposed to be just panicking about our survival but I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing about movement and change and growth in the church, which of course is God's vision for the church. And so I think that's been wonderful. And a sense of holy urgency, I would say, that it's kind of God is impelling us to do things, compelling us to do things. And so it's not about kind of just so we'll be here in two years' time when you come back and have another lovely synod, but it's kind of what is it going to be down the road. And so I see, I think, a diocese that is engaged not in problem solving, but in adaptive change. How can we be more flexible? What does that look like? And so my prayer is that that's not just something that's happening kind of at, at a diocesan level, but it's happening at a parish level and it's happening at a personal level for all of you. And that would be my prayer for you. I hope that you, I, I hope that you're able to go back and in your own parishes to be able to think about some of the ways of finding out what's going on that we learn from processes such as appreciative inquiry, and so that you can discover what is going on in your parish, what's the real story, and you won't find out unless you talk to one another, and that you share the dream of what might be and then design kind of what should be and deliver what will be where you're placed and that you keep doing that over and over again, around and around and around and around. Um, I think you do the same thing here. Uh, uh, back home in Edmonton, we have mission action plans um, where we try and decide what we're going to do over the next few years. And there was a big hope, I think, when, that, when we originally started to do this, that you could do one and then never have to do another one because then you've got the mission action plan. And there was a certain level of, of, of sadness when it became something that we're doing all the time, every year, around and around, to keep us focused on what God's calling us to be and do. So I, I would have a caution for you, and I think as a diocese you're very aware of this caution from everything I've heard about how you're spending money and how you're, you're, you're setting goals, and that is to beware the elephant in the room, and the elephant is not sex, yes, it's... Um, <laughs> The elephant is actually that real difficulty between uh, people who want to have a conversation about sustainable ministry and people who want to have a conversation about missional ministry and they think they're at odds with each other. And you have those very difficult conversations when, um, I'm sure you never have them here, I'm sure it's just something that I've heard somewhere but never here, um, which is someone says, well, you know, imagine the, uh, the wonderful program we heard about redeeming the commute, right? What about, I'm sure you don't have people who ever says, well, when is that going to be self-sufficient? When will that pay for itself? I'm sure that would never cross anyone's mind here, right? That you would ha have those kinds of arguments. But that can become a bit of an elephant, perhaps not at the diocesan level, because you're working very hard, it seems to me, to, to what the uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury called the mixed economy. It seems to me that you're doing that really well with new initiatives, traditional parishes, and everything in between. But I think sometimes that happens to us on a parish level, that someone has this great idea and they want to do various things. And then we don't mean to do it, but then someone says, when will they take envelopes? 
or when will they do the pre-authorized giving? And we can do that at a personal level, at a parish level, at a diocesan level. So I would just say, you know, keep being aware of that, that you don't kind of weigh the new against the traditional and, and kind of look at it in, in terms of that, that way of looking at it. And if you really want to explore that hugely, I would uh, commend you to have a look at some of the work of Eric Eric Law, if you've come across his work. Um, he works out of the Kaleidoscope Institute in LA. He also works with a number of dioceses throughout Canada. Um, and he has a, a great new book out called Holy Currencies. Holy Currencies. And he talks about how you manage to weave those two conversations about missional ministry and sustainable ministry in a way that people don't get you know, upset or think that one has to play off against the other. So if you're interested in how you can kind of be become better equipped for those conversations, I commend that. Um, as a church, it seems to... Oh. Uh -huh. um, it's uh, that we, we are navigating, we're navigating a, a period of significant change for us um, because I think for a long time the church bought into the idea that if we just did what we've always done but do it you know, with even more energy then, then it's all going to be alright and we finally realized that we, we have to do some things differently and change. And so how do we steer through this time of change? And do we have a vision for the church in the 21st century which is authentic to Jesus and faithful and helps us to become what we're called to be? Now that sounds a bit like a motherhood and apple pie statement, but it's really true. Do you have a vision for the church? It seems to me that you here in Toronto, you do have a really wonderful vision for the church and you've taken up the challenge and I will leave here, as I say, energized and with renewed hope in and for the church. And I hope you will too. And I hope that, and that's pretty much an Advent focus, isn't it? That that hope is going to drive you to take big risks and to dream bigger dreams for your own parishes. There's a playwright in England called Alan Bennett. Oh. And he says that life is rather like opening a tin of sardines, but all looking for the key. Now, if you're not English, you, oh, stop it. No, go back. There. And um, if, you, if you don't eat sardines, then, then this will mean nothing to you. But if you do eat sardines, they come in these little tins, and they have this key, and you wind it, and it breaks halfway through, and then you have to mangle the sardines to get them out. And so it's kind of this big challenge, and a normal can opener it doesn't work, and it's just messy, messy, messy. So we as a church are trying to look for the key. What is the key for us in, the, in, in this time? And it seems to me that you are finding it. The missional moments have been great, and they've all been so different. I love the fact that there were, there were some rural ones and there were some urban ones, and there were ones for different ages. So it's not just that this idea of what it's like to be a missional church is just for one group in one place and that is enormously encouraging and I hope you're encouraged by that. I said yesterday that we, you know, we have to move and that it, what it was like to go out and move on Ash Wednesday in Edmonton and for people saying you came out. Well, I think you are a church on the move, perhaps not quite like that, but um, that you're doing it. You seem to have a flexibility of approach at the diocesan level and there's permission to try new things. And I, I wonder if you realize how blessed you are by that. I don't know that you necessarily do, because maybe you're really used to it. But it is a great blessing to be given permission to try new things in the diocese, but also in the parish. So my challenge to you is, how will you go back tomorrow, and when that person who's just started and just been there for a few weeks comes up and challenges the people who've been there for years and says, what if we did this, how will you encourage that? How will you encourage them to kind of share their ideas and, and to listen to new things? How will you be permission givers in your parish? Think of the ministry you're involved in. That's right, just think of it right now. I can't tell if you are, but you're all being very still, so I'm assuming you are. Right, so think of the ministry you're involved in. How can you go home and be a permission giver? How can you kind of push back the constraints we sometimes place on people's involvement in the church? How can you jump on the next good idea? You've heard so many ways that people have done it, so how will you be able to take it home? And how can you be a force for flexibility in your parish? You're not afraid of change. I think that's fantastic. 
I, so many people have said, it's not, it's not like it used to be. We're trying this, and some things haven't worked, and some things have, but it's great. So you seem to be a diocese that aren't scared. That's fantastic. That's really good. That's an amazing thing. So when you get home, can you help other people not to be afraid? I would hope that at the workshops that you've been to and in the mission moments, something has triggered and you're maybe thinking, we, you know what, we could try something like that. Maybe you're not all going to learn how to speak Spanish and do those kinds of things. And maybe, maybe the commuter train, you call it the go train, right? Go train? Yes. Maybe the go train doesn't come through where you are. Maybe everybody's driving, in which case a podcast isn't probably going to be a very good idea. We have laws about that in Alberta. Um, but, but, so, but what is it that you will do in your neighborhood? We challenged our parishes. We gave out a demographic um, information done by a marketing website. And we challenged people to overlay who actually lived in the area over the parish list to see how they compared. Most people, you know, needed chocolate or a stiff drink afterwards because it was a very scary thing to do. But, you know, when you know who's around and you know what's going on and you want to take a risk and try something, um, I think that's a fantastic place to be in, but it can be scary for people. So I would just warn you to be aware of the roller coaster of change. I was going to find something with people screaming on it, right? You can't read those words. Don't worry about it. I will send you the book if you want to. Um, but it's, it's the idea that when something is going to be different, and it doesn't matter what it is, it, I mean, it could be something like, well, we're not going to be purple for Advent. We're going to be blue. Um, that's a big change for some people, which causes shock and horror, right? And, and many things can happen, or, you know, we're, we're going to move the service time, or well, you know the kinds of things, anyway. And, for, and so, theory would say that when you announce a change, even if it's something you want, there's a whole bunch of emotions and reactions that are like going down the, the top of the roller coaster, and there can be shock, or a fight or flight kind of thing, or rage, or anxiety, or turmoil, or feelings. Of, you don't see this in your churches, I know this. But when you, you know, so, so the change comes up, and then you get to the bottom, and you, you kind of think, okay, well, I can stick with it, or I can, I can, I can ignore it, or I can forget this crazy plan. But then, as you kind of come up for the next bit, you start to feel better and more encouraged about it. So when you go home and try and put into practice some of the things that you've heard, because frankly, what is the point of coming here and learning this stuff if you don't want to go home and try something out? Um, how will you give people time to get on board? And how will you give space for them to feel the way they do and to just relax and get used to a time of change? Or are you gonna go back tonight, go into church, change things around, tell them they're doing everything differently, and then they come in tomorrow morning and say, what have you done? Are you going to give them time to get used to the idea? And that comes back into that relationship piece I spent so much time talking about yesterday, that if you're in a good relationship with people, then you want to have those conversations to prepare for a new vision and then move on together. The together is huge. And when you get back, you're all leaders in your parishes. People are going to both yearn for and resist your effective leadership. They'll want you to help them change, but they will not want you to help them change. So you're going to need to be really adaptable. We've seen so much of that at this synod. Flexible, seen that too. And you're going to have to be resilient for when people say, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. If you think God's calling you to do it, you should do it. So I couldn't have a presentation where Johnny didn't come with me. So you can just look at Johnny for a moment. Um, in the film Net Finding Neverland, Johnny Depp says, we dream on a budget here. Now, you have, you have a kind of budget in the Diocese of Toronto that I can only dream about. You have no idea. It's like, wow. We have a working budget every year of about $1 million for the, for the whole diocese. Um, but what I was really excited to hear about is that you have the opportunity, and you have had through your campaign, to have little grants which are huge to me, let me face it, um, but, but grants to help get a ministry going, to try out a new idea. You've got the resources to do that. And again, I hope you realize how blessed you are. So the only thing that would hold you back is not to have an idea 
Well, in every parish, if you get your people together and chat, ideas will flow. They really will flow. So isn't that amazing that you know, God is speaking into your communities and that you have the resources to follow that dream and that your budget is going to allow you to do that. And you have all these extra initiatives of help and support and resources. So one of the takeaways I hope for you at the Synod is how supported you are. You have such amazing resources around you. And quite frankly, I, I think there's nothing that, that you won't be able to do. It's just incredible at the supports that you have. So I hope that you just grab them with both hands and run with it. And if you have any left over, send it to me. That'll be fine. Okay. And um, the other thing I would say is for anyone in leadership at the parish level or at the diocesan level, there's always that moment where you think, you know, am I on the right track? Is, is what I'm doing really the way we should be going? And the thing that has impressed me about the Synod is the amount of back and forth conversation with one another where you've said, well, this is what we're doing. And someone else goes, well, we tried that. And we had to then kind of make changes and do it this way. And a lot of exchange of ideas. And I think that's how the Synod's that synods are supposed to work, that they're kind of a melting pot of ideas where we all take away something that we can use. Um, I usually think if I go to a conference slash synod and I get one thing, just one thing I can go home and do something with, then it's not a total bust, right? You don't think in those terms, I'm sure. But you've come here and learned so many things to take home and you've, I, I think it's great. You know what's going on in your neighborhood. You know who lives there, right? And so that is wonderful. You're really thinking about who is here and how do we connect and what does that look like, whether it's for a social justice piece or for a community piece or really reaching out in, in an evangelism discipleship piece. And by the way, those things, they were actually all the same thing. They're connected. I came here wondering, is the Missio Dei, uh, the mission of God, is it the same across the country? Are we trying to do the same things? because sometimes it's easy to think that you know what we do is very isolated. And I've been delighted to find that we're doing the same thing. So either we're all crazy together or, or God is doing one thing across the church, which is calling people to discipleship, calling people to evangelism, calling people to missional living, personally, in the parish and in the diocese. Um, so doing the same kinds of things. Um, for example, having conversations with people that perhaps we haven't been speaking to uh, for a long time. In Edmonton, we're aware that by 2016, uh, we will have the largest urban population of indigenous people anywhere in the country. And so one of our new initiatives has been to start an indigenous ministry initiatives, which we started with the grand sum of $68,163. The three was very important. Um, but just to, to, to push into that water, we hadn't, we hadn't been there before. It wasn't something that the Diocese of Edmonton had done outside of an inner city um, pastoral uh, response ministry, but to try new things. And so to hear of the new places that you're going is encouraging too. Um, and so and how that moves on and takes its shape in the, in the diocese. We also have a rural ministry initiative in Edmonton, so it's been great to hear about your ministries of what that looks like and um, how you are shaping those communities. We're doing very similar things uh, in uh, Back to Church Sunday, Seasons of Invitation. So how exciting was it to hear about your um, invitational initiatives? Um, that was great. I hope you really enjoyed that. I thought that that video was fantastic and those ideas about what we do next. Is that me? It's not me. It sounds like the hockey. Is it hockey? No. Okay. Um, in terms of messy church and youth initiatives, very similar things going on in both places. Um, I was uh, intrigued. I haven't managed to catch her yet, but um, and maybe she could wave at me and then I can find her later. When I arrived, someone was talking about some uh, new monastic communities, intentional uh, way, ways of being together. She's here somewhere, I'll find her later. And I'm um, doing the same thing where we are. And the idea of how can you use the resources you have in new and exciting ways and knowing that it's a 
church is about more than the building. I haven't heard anything here about keeping the resources we've been blessed with by God and keeping them for a rainy day because we just might need them. And if we get a smaller and smaller group of people who come to worship, it's okay as long as we can play the bills. That has been totally absent from this synod, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So I, I hope you realize that. We have uh, had to focus on keeping true to the message. I've thrown that up because we borrowed horribly from you uh, in, in the VCP conference that you have, Vital Church Planting Conference, and uh, that you do in association with Wycliffe, uh, Wycliffe College. And so we've been piggybacking on that, bringing it to Edmonton. I throw that up there just because um, people will be very keen on you to find another thing to focus on. Missional will become old language and people will be saying what's the next best thing and some people in your parish perhaps in your area perhaps in the diocese might not invest in the change and will try and wait you out don't let them wait you out will God will God give up having a mission in this world you <laughs> bet he won't right so to have a missional church that is active and going out in the community, it's always going to be the plan. So I encourage you to stick to it, to know what you're about. Um, our, our diocesan uh, vision statement is to proclaim the gospel, make disciples, and further the kingdom. And we talk about it all the time. And when you go home, I hope that you will talk about compassionate service, intelligent faith, and godly worship so that that is really well known in your parish, in every single parish, and that by those means you help people to discover their own spiritual DNA. Who are they? Who are we called to be as Christians? So that we are brave enough to tell our story, to share our faith, and to go out and invite other people into relationship with Christ. And we've heard so many people telling stories about exactly those three things, your, your themes, which have been very encouraging. You've been welcoming difficult conversations. And that's great because you know how it is when, when kind of life seems to get a little bit tough. There's stuff that we just don't want to talk about. And, and God bless the person who stood up and said, what about, um, what about the fact that some of our children don't come to church or some of our grandchildren don't come to church? I think that's a great conversation to take into parishes to say, so, so what can we do? Not so that we can get a net and get them back, because do you remember I said yesterday that thing from Vincent Watts' name about don't tell people to go to a place where they never were? Because maybe they were never there under their own steam as having given their lives to Jesus for themselves personally. Maybe it was still at that point where we were encouraging people to make that step, but we didn't find a way to help them make the step for themselves and I'm not bashing confirmation, but you know, there's sometimes that there are still some people for whom that is kind of graduation, and, and after graduation you get to leave, and we don't want that. So, so how as a church, for the people who are there right now, do you help them to make that mature decision to give their life to Christ and, and grow up in the life of the church? rather than get a net to catch maybe we think the ones that got away. You might get them, but how do you deal with who you have now and invite people to come back if they've been away? There's great conversations for you to have in your parishes, and you know which one you need to have first. When you go home and talk about this stuff, you will know what is the most pressing need for you. What is the truth you will tell when you go home about this synod? What would you go home and tell people about the future and mission of the church here in the Diocese of Toronto? At coffee tomorrow morning, in the sermon tomorrow morning, maybe, who knows? Um, what are you going to say about the mission of the church? Because I think I've heard everybody saying, oh, it's been a great synod, we've heard such good things. Well, now you, it's your job to make sure that this isn't the best kept secret in the Diocese of Toronto, all right? So what are you going to ho go home and say to people tomorrow? Because if you go home and say, it was great. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> Sandwiches were good. Lovely fellowship. 
That's all great, but that's not what you need to go home and do. You know that and I know that, but once you get home and it's Advent and it's busy and da di da di da you, you, you may kind of think, well, I'm not sure, what is my key message? So I hope before you leave this room, oh no, she's telling us to do something again, make her go away, these bishops, um, on these wonderful pads that you have, write down the big thing that you want to go home and say. What do you want to go home and say to the people in your parish about what you've learned here? What is the thing that is going to stick in your mind? Write it on a piece of paper, fold it up, stick it in your pocket, stick it in your purse, or put it into your iPhone or your iPad or whatever. And when you get back tomorrow, make sure you say it. Otherwise, it has a danger of getting lost. And then you think, oh, well, you know, we'll discuss this at Vestry in January. Really? No, tell them tomorrow, because if it's exciting, you need to kind of tell people what it is that we're excited about. Have people pray about what is God calling the mission, the church to do in this season of expectation right now? What is the take home for you? What is your truth? And in doing that, and even speaking about it, you're going to take a huge leap of faith, right? You're just going to take a leap of faith from where you are into the new thing, right? And we've heard lots of leaps in faith, which should encourage us to do the same, really, hey? It really should. So embrace who you are. I couldn't resist this. This is Back to Church Sunday, Alberta style in Wainwright. Um, so embrace who you are in, in kind of, this is where we live. These are the people around us. This is what we feel called to be. But dream big enough to take a leap of faith. Give people some time to get on board, right? Because some people will need it. They'll be stuck on that roller coaster going, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we can do this. If all else fails, call or phone or text or Facebook Michael Harvey and ask for a set of these cards for your next meeting. You may have seen these before, church management bingo. You'll have a great time. What you do, you keep them at the vestry table and here are the comments. We've never done it that way before. I bet you never say that in Toronto. Or we're not ready for that. Or we're doing all right without it. Or we tried it once before. And yet then the unspoken thing, and it didn't work then. All right, it costs too much. You have resources. That's not our responsibility. It just won't work. So if you want to play that in a, in a fun but not really very effective way, just get a stamp, mark them up, shout bingo when you've got to the end of it. But if you want to do it in a more exciting way than that, do it this way. When they say these things, when they say to you, we've never done it that way before, can you come back with Isaiah 43, verse 19? Behold, God is doing a new thing. When they say, we're not ready for that, can you say, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us? We're doing all right without it. Can you say, but we need to be about God's business? We've tried it once before. Can you say, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up? It costs too much but our needs are supplied by God according to the riches of his grace. That's not our responsibility, but we're God's ambassadors. It just won't work. We are more than conquerors through Christ. Are you ready to get back in and shout bingo in a different way? Because I think as we've seen here, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? You are really privileged to live and work and minister in a diocese that supports you and has resources. And you are a fantastic people supporting one another and it's been an encouragement to be here. And so if you're wondering, when, when should you do this? When should you encourage your parish and one another to be more missional, to be more about looking for what God is doing? All I can say to you is, now is the opportune time. <laughs> Thanks very much.